Well, a happy Mother's Day to all of you moms and grandmas here on this day that we, as a nation, set aside a time to remember and be thankful for the mothers that God has given to us. And I'd just like to take a moment and uh, read a, a prayer, really read, and then also be praying to the Lord as I'm reading this special blessing over the moms. And I know that this can also be a difficult time, as maybe this is the first Mother's Day since your mother passed away, or maybe this is the first Mother's Day that you've had since you've had a child that has passed away, or maybe you didn't oftentimes have, or still to this day may not have, a great relationship with your mom. I'm going to be praying also for healing and forgiveness to happen in your heart and in your soul today as this is a time that it is a time of rejoicing, but it can also be a time of grief and sadness. So let's go to our Lord at this time. Father, we approach your throne on behalf of the mothers and grandmothers whom you have entrusted with the care of your most precious little ones. We thank you for creating each mom with a unique combination of gifts and talents. We thank you for the sacrifice of self that each mom gives for her children, for the late nights spent rocking a colicky infant, for the hands that are calloused from washing, wiping, scrubbing, mixing, stirring, hugging, patting, disciplining, holding, writing, erasing, painting, and pouring. We ask that you would be the daily bread for tired mothers. We ask that you be their living water, we ask that you would be their source of spiritual and physical strength. We pray that the same grace that flowed from father to son to us in salvation will flow from mothers to their children. We pray that each mother would reject perfectionism and instead embrace the goodness of the gospel. We pray that the rhythms of repentance and forgiveness would shape every home. We pray for those who grieve today. We ask for your comfort to surround those who weep. We pray for the peace of your presence to cover their minds and thoughts. As you remind us, the enemy can never steal us out of your hands. He never has the final say over our lives. We are kept safe in your presence forever, whether in life or in death. As we know that Mother's Day can bring a mix of emotions for many, there are those anticipating the birth of their first child, Stepmothers wondering what their place is. Those who have lost their mother and are faced with grieving on this Mother's Day. There are moms who encounter feelings of hurt because their children have turned from God and those overwhelmed with the pain of loss of a child. There are some here today, Lord, that we know that their mothers don't know you. Lord, we pray that you would give them opportunities to share the love of Christ with their moms so that these women could know the grace that comes from salvation. May you help those to forgive whose moms did not live up to the self-sacrificing love that we all expect. No matter what many are facing on this day, we turn to you, our Heavenly Father, to experience peace and healing through prayer. And may we all draw closer to you through every trial and joy that comes into our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I know that there are people that have mixed uh, feelings about reading a prayer. For the longest time, I'll even admit that I would have never done that probably 10-ish years ago in my own ministry as uh, oh, prayers can't be recited. It needs to be something that is spirit-driven that comes from the heart. And then I think about the same time there are some people that say, you should never prepare for a message. You should simply let the Spirit work through you, preacher, in that moment. Don't study ahead of time. Let God speak. And I began to realize that uh, maybe I let the pendulum go too far, even in my own prayer life. And there are times that I believe that God can use a pre-written prayer that has been Spirit-led in the writing of that prayer to touch someone's heart. And even in our public discourse and liturgy, uh, as someone who, again, railed against liturgical things for a long time, I thank God that he has given me the grace to grow in my own personal ministry and in my own personal life. And just uh, there is something to be said for the liturgical practices of things that have been 
here long before I was and things that will still be here long after I am gone. Because it has a way of connecting us together. Connecting us even to the ancient ones from long ago who also walked with the same Jesus and the same Holy Spirit. Worshiping and praying to the same Father in heaven. And what a joy it is to bring even a prayer like this today. And I hope that it was something that was speaking to your heart as it did to mine. We like to read this passage and really again even pray this passage. Psalms 86 verses 11 through 13 is a way of preparing our hearts. And as this is a liturgical thing that we do, I don't want it to ever become just something rote that doesn't have any meaning. But, oh, is it not there? <laughs> All right, let's see who can remember it. This always freaks me out because I'm the guy with the microphone. So, you know, if I mess up, then everybody knows. You can all just like say watermelon and move your mouths and not ever have anything come out. Nobody's going to know. But, uh, all right, Psalms 86, here we go. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever, for great is your love toward me. Hey, that was pretty good. At this time, the kids can be dismissed to go to the junior church. And I invite you to open your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5 is where we're going to be today as we kind of close out this couple of weeks series in Luke 5 about being purposeful. God has a purpose for our lives and he wants us to he wants to fill us with that purpose as we seek Jesus Christ and as we are filled with his Holy Spirit we will be filled with that purpose. And in Luke chapter 5 we saw how Jesus had the he was teaching, he called out Peter and told him, "Hey, you cast on the other side, cast your nets over there." And then he picked that pulled out that big draught of fish as it's oftentimes called and then he called Peter and Andrew and James and John were called as his disciples and then he did a couple of healings last week he did some miracles showing proving that he is the God man and that he not only has the power to heal but that he said I've done this that way you can know that I have the power to forgive sin and the time or the purpose that we can have in suffering, that there are times we don't understand why God is bringing us through these things, but there is a purpose in it to draw us closer to Him. And now today, as we begin in verse 27, we are once again going to see that Jesus is specifically calling out a specific purpose. He is seeking out, remember the key verse, for the Gospel of Luke is Luke 19.10, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And here in Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 27, After these things, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. So Levi left all, rose up, and followed him. Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house, and there was a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. And the scribes and the Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. To repentance. It was interesting to me as I was thinking about this and uh, a few weeks ago and how this particular passage ended up on Mother's Day as we have this man, a tax collector by the name of Levi. Any Jewish person would know that the Levites were the tribe of Israel that God had set aside to be the priestly tribe. They were the ones that were supposed to be separated from the world. They were the ones that they had no earthly possession, really. They didn't get a land. They didn't get some inheritance. They didn't get something that was like, okay, 
even if everything else is crashing down around me, I've got this little bit of a nest egg to fall back on. The only thing, I'm using my quote, the only thing that they had was God. <laughs> the possession that they would have was to a life of service in the temple, the tabernacle, before the temple was built. And so naming your child Levi was really a way that their parents would have been hearkening all the way back to those promises that God had given to his people about, look at this, he is going to serve God. We have a son that I can't imagine. Can you believe what the, the mother would do? Having this little tiny baby that God had blessed them with, having this son, and they named him Levi, thinking, ah, there is a special thing that God has in this child's life. And we are going to train him up in the way that he should go, so that when he is old, he will not depart from it. As I'm sure they had read from Solomon's Proverbs many times. And yet, when this man became an adult, he was not found serving in the temple. He was not found being a, a good little Jewish boy. A religious person who was out there proselytizing on behalf of the Father. No, you would find him in the tax office. Now, even today, uh, I'm not a huge fan of taxes. I don't know anybody that wakes up every day and says, Man, I can't wait to pay taxes today. It's an awesome day. Woo! I love April 15th. Day comes every year, and I just get fired. Maybe if you're a CPA, maybe that's something. You're like, yes, I get excited about that. But other than that, now, I don't know anybody that's excited about paying taxes. But even then, while we have a, hey, you know, tax is theft, and you got some libertarians that love to just uh, really drive other things and like that and make kind of jokes and be funny about it, in this day, it was much more... I think, than the discomfort we have towards the Internal Revenue Service. This was an oppressive regime with the Romans that had come in, had taken over, and now if you were going to be a tax collector on behalf of the Romans... You were ostracized from society. You were excommunicated from synagogue. You were not allowed to be a part of the Jewish religious community in any way. You were an anathema to your family. And sometimes for good reason. Because if you were going to collect taxes on behalf of the Roman government, essentially what it was is that there was a bidding war that would take place. They would go to the kind of procurator of the, the Romans in that area, and there would be people They would say, hey, I will collect, I'm just making up numbers now, I'll collect 500 for you today. And somebody else say, I bet I can collect 600. Somebody else the next day would say, I can get 800 out of these people. And it would be this bidding war that would take place. Now, you don't want to overbid it, because if you don't pay the Romans, then your life is on the line. But if you got one of these gigs, it was just amazing, because now, under threat of the Roman guard, who would be dispatched to serve you to go collect those taxes, you could go around, and if you only owed 20, I could tell you that you actually owed 40, and there's nothing you could do about it. I pay the Romans the 20, and guess what I get to keep? All the rest. So it was, it was known that tax collectors were liars, they were thieves, they were underhanded, they were terrible, terrible people. And if you want to say this, they were murderers by extension, or slaveholders by extension, because, oh, I, don't, I didn't actually kill you. No, I just turned you over to the Roman guard who would torture and kill you for not paying your taxes. So you can kind of imagine what it must have been like for these parents <laughs> naming their son Levi 
having all these amazing hopes that this child would turn into a man of God, to see those hopes dashed, crushed, as he became a tax collector. Matthew is also how we know this man. The Gospel of Matthew, written by Levi the tax collector. Because I think it got to a point to where he no longer would go by his Hebrew name or he was not known by his Hebrew name because he had become so ostracized so he took on the name Matthew, a Greek Roman name. <laughs> People wouldn't want to even associate him with a Hebrew name anymore. And this is some speculation on my part here, but I can understand the anger, the hatred that some people, I can at least empathize with them. And so it must have been amazing for these, these few men that Jesus had called at this point, for the crowds that were all around that had heard him teach, and they had seen it, and the Bible has written several times at this point, People knew that Jesus taught and spoke with authority. And to see them walking by the tax office and see Jesus stop, I can only imagine Peter kind of, yes, all right. Jesus is going to give it to him. Ha ha. Woo, this is going to be great. Get him, Jesus. Get him, Rabbi. Yeah, let him have it. It's always nice when somebody in power that's on your side of an argument starts to let him have it kind of feels good and gets, gets your juices going. So what must it have been like when Jesus stopped in front of the tax office and looks at Levi and the words that come out of his mouth are, follow me. <laughs> what? Lord, I think you said the wrong thing. You know who that guy is, right? You know what he does. You know who he works for. You know who he has swindled and taken advantage of, right? Maybe that's one of the reasons the Apostle Paul wrote that God uses the things of this world, the simple things, the things that don't make sense to us to confound the wise. He takes and he chooses the people that no one would have expected. Some of the worst of the worst. But that is what the gospel does. It is able to take the worst of the worst and through the Spirit of God, with the blood of Jesus Christ applied to their souls, they are forgiven and saved just like anyone else. And the transforming that happens, it's incredible. I remember so many times being a kid during like a Sunday night church service or some kind of a singspiration service, there'd be people, they would get up and they would have all these testimonies of, man, I was an alcoholic, I was a drug addict, I was, a, I, was, I was living way, way on the other side of the tracks from the way Jesus said to live. And then people would be saying, amen, and praise God. I said, but then I met Jesus and my life was changed. And so what? that's the story of Levi. What a powerful thing it is when God takes someone that no one would have ever expected to be a religious guy and then grabs a hold of their heart and pulls them in close to Christ. And man, it's just night and day. But I'll be honest with you, being somebody that grew up in church, that my parents had gotten saved, and I've been in church since I was still in the womb. <laughs> Sometimes I remember listening to those things and I was saying, so I don't, man, I don't have a testimony like that. I, I ain't never done a whole bunch of drugs. 
I'd never been blacked out drunk. I wasn't, you know, going all over town. I wasn't vandalizing. I've never been arrested. I, I did almost get arrested in front of a Star Wars movie one time, but that's a story for another day. <laughs> but I was thinking, I haven't had one of these. But then I'll remember there were people that would encourage me, though, that said, you know what? Yeah, we went through some of those things, but you know why I became a Sunday school teacher? You know why I do vacation Bible school? <laughs> you know why I do all these things in the church? So that way God can grab a hold of your heart from a young age, so that way you don't have to go through all those things. I praise God for any amount of time that he gives you to serve him. I don't care if it's 10 days before you pass away from this earth that you were serving him, or 10 years, or... I pray in my case, God gives me a hundred and something years to be able to uh, continue to serve him. That was a little joke. I don't know if I'm actually going to that long. <laughs> but what a treasure it is when God is able to grab a hold of a young person. They don't have to, you know, oh, I just was... I used my 20s to kind of experience life and, you know, just kind of throw off all the barriers. I'll get serious in my 30s and 40s. That's when I'll really... I'm glad I didn't waste my 20s. I'm glad that I invested my 20s. I have no regrets that I have been in church and serving God for the majority of my, the vast majority of my life. And maybe you're here today and you're looking back and you're thinking, yeah, you know what, I did waste a lot of time. Levi is your story. And God is able to grab your life and take you from the moment that he says to you, follow me, and then if you respond like Levi did, so... He left all, rose up, and followed him. I mean, there, there was no confusion. There, were, there was no uh, uh, questioning Jesus. Jesus, do you know who I am? Do you see what I've done? I mean, uh, why would you pick, why would you choose me? No, Levi just recognized who Christ was and recognized that calling, and he left it all behind and followed him. He was going to, as the book of Ephesians says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Let's redeem the time that God has for us in our lives. Let's use that time. Invest that time. Let's follow him. Let's purposefully, as Jesus has purposefully sought us, let's now go out into the world and purposefully seek others that need him as well. Use your story. Use your testimony as, as some way to share. There are people that are never going to come to Christ because I lead them, because they say, oh, well, yeah, I mean, you're one of those goody two-shoes kids. You're one of those guys you always in church. Uh, I mean, yeah, of course, you're a church guy, but, but God can't love me because of what I've done. That's where maybe your story fits in and say, you know what, I had the same thoughts. But praise God, if Jesus can save me, he can save you too. Use your testimony as a major, wonderful tool for evangelism. And it's amazing to think about what this verse means. It's so he left all, rose up, and followed him. I mean, it seems like, oh, wow, great thing. Again, now, thinking back on the context of it, Think about all that Levi left behind. Wealth beyond anything that he could ever spend in ten lifetimes. A cushy gig that had uh, Roman guards. Anybody tries to come at him, the Romans are going to stop you. And then on the other side of that, trying to get out of a contract like that that you have with Rome and say, you know what, I've decided I'm going to follow this, this new 
Jesus guy. And I'm not going to collect taxes anymore on your behalf. That could come with a death sentence. So Levi was in many ways literally putting it all on the line. <laughs> when he decided to leave this behind to follow Christ. And you know what I love about this is that, okay, so Jesus calls him, and then Levi starts to follow him, but immediately, Levi recognizing now the, the change that has happened and the, the gift that he has been given. So then in verse 29, then Levi gave Jesus a great feast in his own house. Again, he had the ability, the financial ability to do that. This huge feast. And there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. So Levi gets together all of his tax collector buddies and says, you guys, you got to meet Jesus. That's again why I say Christ is going to use you with your unique life experience to be able to reach people that no one else potentially can. If Peter had walked up to one of the other Roman tax collectors and said, hey, I want you to meet Jesus, they would have been like, get away from me. Get out of here. Who are you? I don't need to listen to you, you, you disgusting dog, you fisherman. Go! But because Levi was one of them, he was a part of their circle, he had an in. And he used that opportunity to lead other people to Jesus. Now it was up to them whether or not they wanted to follow Christ. But he did his part about planting and watering the seeds and leading them to Jesus. And I tell you what, there's this awesome revival that's happening now. I mean, Levi's got revived in his heart. He's bringing other people in. There, there's still crowds around this great multitude. of who, who knows who the others were? And in the midst of all this, people meeting Jesus. Then we get verse 30. And the scribes and the Pharisees complained against his disciples. Why are you eating with tax collectors and sinners? Ah. How dare you spend time with people that don't know God so that way they can know God? It still happens today, folks. If we're not careful, if we become so insulated as a church body that where, you know, if a sinner happens to start coming to church or being a part of various things, or if someone, I saw where they were the other day, that place has a bunch of sinners. You notice it doesn't say that Jesus went and sat in the temple and he waited for the tax collectors and sinners to come to him. He went to a tax collector's house that was filled with other evil tax collectors and other sinners. He went to them. And it's challenged the, uh, me these last few weeks as I've been reading through this and, and trying to think about how, how can we reach out? I have our sister Kelly who lives over these apartment complexes right around the corner over here off of Sunrise. She'd been calling me several times during the week and saying, hey, you know, I just, God was doing something in my heart and I was sharing it with some other neighbors. I was thinking, man, Lord, this is, this, is, this is Luke chapter 5, right in front of our faces. So maybe there needs to be some of us that instead of sitting here in the ivory towers of, of a church building, you 
You need to go over to one of those apartments and set up a place where we can pray with people. Have a little Bible study together. Take over our snow cone machine and on a hot summer day. Let those kids and those parents and sinners know that there's a Jesus that wants to save them. Where is it that you live that maybe there's something that we can do? If God's, if God's touching your heart right now saying, you know what, I, I live in a, a community, I live in a place, and I, I've even been trying to think, okay, Lord, how can I use my house? There's a couple of people right now on our block. The houses are changing. You know, renters are moving out. New renters are moving in. And I'm trying to think, okay, God, how, how, can, we, how can we get these people? How can we show them, introduce them to Christ if, if they need you? And what can we do? Maybe you live in a place where there's lots of people around. Whether it's an apartment complex, trailer park, whether it's in your own neighborhood right there, and there's something that we as a church that we can, we can, we can put a, a, an event together, or we can put a backyard barbecue together, or we can do something. Why don't we do that at the church? Because they might not come to the church. But they might come to your house because they know you. And there, sitting around a table with some broken bread and there's where they might meet Jesus and have their entire eternity changed, have their life transformed like that. So if that's something that maybe God is laying on your heart today that you may want to be a part of and you may have a place that you're willing to open up and let's let's do something. Because Levi, man, he opened up his home and yeah, there were people around that they were all uh, complaining and they were grumbling and but Jesus just simply answered and said to them, those who are well have no need of physician, those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And Jesus was tongue in cheek here. He wasn't actually calling those men righteous. He was saying, but if you feel like you're righteous in and of yourselves, you won't repent. Because in order for repentance, a change of mind to happen, you need to recognize that you're going the wrong way. So I've come to call sinners who see, yeah, I'm one of those people that I'm not good. (laughs) I've got problems. I want to see them turned around. But if you're thinking, no, I'm good. I've got it all together. Everything's fantastic in my life. Jesus says, then, then you don't have any need for the physician. You're good, I guess. And in the other sense, we could also say in part of this that once I know Christ, I'm going to still become sanctified more and more. I should still be growing to be more like him. But one of the greatest missions that's on my life is to share with others who don't know Christ yet. I want to be more like him. I'm going to grow to be more like him. I'm going to gather with others to worship and serve together. But every single one of us that are a part of the church of God, the church of Jesus Christ, we have a mission in our lives to tell other people about Christ. Some people are better at that than others. Some people have a bigger burden than that than others. But it is still our mission to lead those who are sick to the great physician so they can be healed for all eternity. So then now the the Pharisees, they don't even want to answer this anymore. They don't want to, okay, Jesus gave us an answer that uh, we, we don't have any anything against it. You know how people do that when you're in a disagreement with someone? If you don't really have a good retort to what they just said, then you just change the subject. So that's what they're going to do here in verse 33. So then they said to him, 
not answering what he just talked about, why he was eating with tax collectors and sinners, because it was a good answer. Well, why the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise those of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. We fast all the time. We are super religious people. I mean, even the disciples of John, who you were baptized by John, weren't you, Jesus? <laughs> and you say you're following kind of in his footsteps, and yet you're not even doing what his disciples do. So instead of trying to internalize what Jesus was teaching, and let's all be cautious of this, because there are times that God starts to convict us of something, and it doesn't feel good. And so instead of yielding to that conviction, I'm just going to change the subject, and I'm going to point out where I am a really good Christian, where I am really religious, and not look at that spot over there. Let's just hide that, sweep it under the rug. Let's focus on where I'm good. Why do they fast? And they pray a lot. Even the disciples of the Pharisees, that was them, by the way. Our disciples are good religious people, but yours aren't. So Jesus said, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? Essentially, Jesus pulls out another little story here. It says, at the wedding feast, we're here enjoying this wonderful time of celebration. The groom and the bride have just been married and we're celebrating with them. Oh, by the way, guys, I know there's this awesome potluck that we all have out here, but today is the day to fast. There's this amazing food all over, but you can't partake in that because, I mean, I'm here, the, the groom, you know. Jesus said, no, you don't do that. That's silly. Going back to Ecclesiastes, there's a season for everything. There are some seasons to rejoice. There are seasons to weep and mourn. There are seasons to where we are fasting, and there are some seasons that where we are enjoying and rejoicing and thanking God for the bounty that he has given. And Jesus said, you don't fast while the bridegroom is there. And this is where he's going to begin to kind of lay some of the the prophetic groundwork for the church and how he is saying now that I am the groom and the church is my bride and while Jesus was there he says no I, I, this is the time where we're going to do some of those other religious observances at another day but right now while I'm here this is the time to feast and rejoice and just take it all in as much as you can because the day is coming Jesus said Verse 35, when the bridegroom will be taken away, and then they will fast in those days. So then he goes on, and he speaks an interesting parable where he says, no one puts a piece of a new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear. Also, the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. And also, no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new, for he says the old is better. It's kind of a mysterious thing that Jesus, all of a sudden, he's talking about uh, being a part of this wedding feast, and, and then suddenly he starts talking about sewing on new patches into old clothes putting new wine into old wineskins. The purpose is that he's saying, I'm bringing in something new. And you're trying to tie in all of these old ways of the law with this new covenant that I'm bringing in. And if I tried to pour this new covenant into your old covenant wineskins or patch up a tear in the old covenant with the new covenant, it doesn't fit. It says, I've come to fulfill the old covenant. I'm going to fulfill all of the law. I didn't come to abolish it. He came to fulfill it. So now we, in the new covenant, this New Testament era, we live under a new law. 
All of the law and the prophets, Jesus said, is fulfilled in this, that you will love the Lord your God with all your mind, whole, soul, heart, and strength, and that you love your neighbor as yourself. The law is fulfilled in these two commandments. But if I do that, don't I still have to have all of the 620 Old Testament laws? Do I have to still do every single... He goes, just love God and love others and everything will take care of itself. I put this new piece of cloth on pre-shrunk jeans. And then when it shrinks, it's just going to tear and make it even worse. See, Jesus said they, they don't fit together. You need to take something new and put it into something new. So I'm here to do away with and fulfill all of that old covenant so that way I can give you something brand new and make your life brand new. In that same way, Christian, there are times that we try to, okay, I want to take some of Jesus, some of the new life, and I want to put it into my old life so that way I can still enjoy some of the sins of this world, but I can kind of put a Christian knees name on them? Jesus said it doesn't work. It'll tear your life apart. So we need to now live in the new covenant. We need to live this new life that Jesus has given to us. Recognize where Jesus has called you from. I really like the, the statement of don't ever forget where Jesus found you. Let's not become so full of ourselves. The longer we walk with Christ, the more that we know His Word, sometimes the easier it is to slip into that kind of pharisaical legalism. Well, I know what I'm supposed to do, what I'm not supposed to do, and so it is for you. Recognize, remember where Christ found us, and remember how long it took Christ to get you to where you are today, and maybe give some other people that are still growing some grace as well. But then let's enjoy the fact that Jesus Christ is with us every single day. He is abiding with us, and He is leading and guiding us through His Spirit, and now we can then be like Levi and bring others to him as well maybe that's where you are today maybe you are levi and you're thinking i, I don't know christ is my savior i maybe i sent something that he's trying to call me to him but i i've been resisting it let's stop resisting and just follow him today maybe god has laid on your heart that there is something there there's in, in an outreach effort that we can make where you live that we can use your home your apartment, your trailer. We can use your place that God has you. He has uniquely put you in that spot for such a time as this to lead other people to Christ. Let's make it happen. Let's let this be a, a summer of fruitful ministry for the kingdom of Christ. Let's not, let's not just kind of coast through the summer. But let's be actively, intentionally seeking after people that Jesus wants to save. And Christian, maybe you've been trying to mix in some of the old and the new. Maybe that's something you need to repent of today and say, okay, Lord, fill me completely with that new covenant. Let me rest and, and enjoy and rejoice in the new covenant that you have given. Lord, every single one of us that have been like Pharisees in the past, convict us of that. Challenge us to turn away from those things and just live in the light of Christ rather than ourselves. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today and thank you for this time that we could spend in your word. Lord, I ask that every single one of us that knows that we have a testimony that we have an old life. We have things that you have called us out from. May we walk with you now the rest of our lives. 
Lord, if there are parents here today that are burdened over children that have gone astray, may, may you give them comfort at this time. May the story of Levi be an encouragement to them that even though a child can go astray, Lord, your power, your gospel is awesome and transforming enough that it can grab even the worst of the worst and turn them around to follow you with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Lord, you took this evil man and allowed him to write Scripture. God, what are you going to do with our lives? Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in our hearts right now. Challenge us, convict us. May we repent of all the ways that we have gone astray. And may we turn back to Christ in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Listen, um, I just wanted to make a couple of comments about something that's happening in our society right now. And with it uh, mean Mother's Day, I found this to be somewhat appropriate with the potential overturning of Roe versus Wade. And I know there's been a lot of discussion about this in the news and things for the last uh, week or so since uh, the leak happened, that there was a potential uh, majority opinion coming out about the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And for the last 50 years or so that this has been law, that there have been over a million abortions a year. And I am... It's, it's interesting to continue to think about what this might mean. Number one, it does not mean that abortion is outlawed in the United States of America. It simply means that it becomes a state's right issue. And so here in California, Governor Newsom came out pretty much about 24 hours after the opinion was leaked and said that we are going to become a sanctuary state for abortion, meaning that uh, people from any other place around the country that need an abortion to be done, whether you are a resident of the state of California or not, go ahead and come. Because there are some states that are drafting other legislation saying that, uh, you know, you need to be a resident, you should meet with your own primary care doctor in your own home state and such. But we are becoming a sanctuary state for the murder of little children. I don't use that term lightly either. I know it gets thrown around a lot in, uh, in this discussion. But when we are saying beyond even what the vast majority of the United States uh, citizens want, there is still a majority of people that think abortion should be legalized in the first trimester. But second and third trimester abortion, you, you are hard-pressed to find anywhere less than about 65 to 90 percent, especially when you get into third trimester stuff. Nobody wants that. And yet, our state is saying, nope, we're going to make a law that says up until the moment of and potentially how you want to read certain laws, even after the child has come through the birth canal, that you have a choice about whether you want that child to live or die. We need to be praying for the leaders in our state to stand up and do what is right and with all this talk of the social justice movement and we want to have justice for those that don't have a voice well who has less of a voice than the pre-born I'm glad that finally we're getting a little more political in this sense and and better at the discussion because so many times in these discussions the most ultra progressive and progressive uh, side of things, they get to decide all the verbiage and how these things, even the pro-choice versus pro-life. Oh, who wants to take away someone's right to choose? It should have been pro-life versus pro-abortion. We should have controlled that conversation 50 years ago, but we let it go. I'm glad that now, and I'm trying to even change my own verbiage in discussions about this and instead of saying a child in the womb there's pre-born <laughs> they haven't been born yet but it's still a life they're just pre-born i really like that term and i think it's one that we can all grab onto and use in these discussions 
And again, I want it to be noted that these should be discussions. I want us as Christians to be people of truth. I want us to be people that speak the truth in love. Recognizing that, statistically speaking, somewhere around one in four and one in five women in the United States of America have had an abortion at some point in their lives. And so, that would mean that there are several of you potentially even in this room. I don't want you to feel like uh, this is a place that, oh, I've made a mistake in my past or I've done something like that in my past and now I'm not welcome any longer. Jesus Christ forgives. He forgives completely. He holds no animosity. It says that he remembers our sin as far as the east is from the west. He doesn't remember it anymore. And also recognizing that when we speak about things, that there may have been someone that has made that decision in the past, and it's very easy to get very amped up, especially when we hear the governor saying things like, this is all about reproductive health rights, and I can't believe that people are trying to control women, even though we couldn't define what a woman was even a few weeks ago, and men can be pregnant, but now suddenly it's once again women, and all kinds of other things. I get that that can get frustrating. Keep that frustration in check, recognizing that there are real lives that have made these decisions. And as we discuss, and as we even if the vitriol and anger, I, I even saw a friend this morning had posted that uh, the pregnancy center that is right around the corner from their church, much like we have one right across the street from our church, was vandalized, spray painted all over, just completely in many ways destroyed by the ultra progressive left wing that is supposedly the ultra tolerant people in society. I can get very angry about that, I can get amped up about it, and it does frustrate me, yet at the same time, I have to recognize that there are still people that while they may be making foolish things, they're trapped in darkness and they need Christ. People. When we talk about policies, it's easy to forget that there are people in the midst of all these political and policy-like decisions. So, Christian, I encourage you, as you have discussions, I'm sure, in the upcoming weeks, and then as the official decision is revealed somewhere probably in the middle of June, oftentimes is when a big dump happens from the Supreme Court about decisions that get made, it's going to reinvigorate a lot of these decisions once again, and there are going to be people also that Christians, if we, want, if we say, hey, I support the pre-born, I want to support adoption, I want to be there, I, then sometimes we may have to then also put our money where our mouth is <laughs> and our time where our mouth is volunteering at pregnancy centers, helping support financially those pregnancy centers, being there because we know that the government, they're not going to support them. but we can. And we can speak on behalf of those little children. We can be their voice. But let us use that voice to speak the truth in love. Try to help, encourage, draw, and graciously show them the love of Christ at a time when they desperately, desperately need it. So, as we close our service today, I want to do that before we had one final song, because I don't want to leave you necessarily with the pall of <laughs> the, the, the weight of that, but it is a weighty thing that's going to be happening over the upcoming weeks and months. And so, I'm going to pray one final time, and then we'll have a, a final song, and then we'll be dismissed. But I want us to specifically pray for those women right now that are potentially seeking or having that, that, that moment of fear. For those in the upcoming days and weeks and months that will have to make that decision as well, that they would choose life. That pregnancy centers would be able to be there and that church bodies, local churches, would step up and they would stand in the gap for those that have no voice. Heavenly Father, we come to you one more time today, Lord, and we just thank you for this time that we could be gathered together. And we thank you, Lord, for the potential that approximately 50 years 
a federal law that uh, may be overturned saying that it is not a fundamental constitutional right to end a life that you have created in the womb. But God, we pray for our state and many others who already right now have trigger laws in place that at the moment that that happens, these laws trigger into effect saying that abortion is legalized. The ending of a life is legalized right up until the moment that it comes from the mother's womb. Lord, I pray for those women that have made that decision in the past that are now heartbroken and grieving, that you could let them know, Lord, that they are forgiven. They could feel your loving arms around them. Lord, for those that are struggling right now, that are fearful that they just found out that they are pregnant and are considering terminating the pregnancy. Lord, may they choose life. Please, Lord, be with those pregnancy centers all across this nation and around the world that are trying to do the Christian thing, trying to stand in the gap and see justice done on behalf of these little precious gifts. Lord, provide for their needs, provide for their financial needs, provide for their human resource needs, let them have plenty of volunteers. And Lord, as we once again just sometimes the, the weight of this world can, can pull us down so deep. May we be uplifted and encouraged through your spirit today. Fill us, Lord, with exactly that purpose that you want us to do. And let us ever draw closer to you in Jesus' name, doing your will for your kingdom and your glory. Amen.